I wasn't always a, um, a science teacher or a technology teacher. I actually started in the industry uh, working for a company known as ICI Australia, now Orica. Um, my first training was in biochemistry and having to use the large automatic analyzers, um, you know, big machines like the PDP-11, uh, required you to have a knowledge of uh, IT and programming. Moving into the high school sector from um, after the rural recession and the mining recession, Mining, yeah, I was a biochemist who ended up in the explosives division. Um, and there is a connection to do with the dissolution of uh, cattle boluses and uh, explosive prill in the bottom of mine shaft. I'd like to share with you a very personal journey. I have a large number of slides and I'm going to rattle through quite quickly. So I'm sorry you won't have much time to tweet or share, but hang in there because as a keynote, I'm going to probably rock your socks with what um, the serendipity of um, opportunity and where I came from. Um, in 1997, well actually 1993, I was the first teacher to get a high school connected with the internet, but I want to jump forward a few years. Um, about the time when you had the Sojourno rover that was uh, rolling around Mars, um, it was an exciting time for being able to connect with technology, um, and this was an animated GIF, and we're all excited about how we can string pictures together in movies and begin to share them. Um, I was one of the first teachers to be able to start using the web and being able to collect resources. Um, this was the school that I was located at. Actually, no, that's the roof of the school I was located at, and we were blessed with um, heavy industry and decline. Um, this was an asbestos factory that was opposite the school, and we would watch it from um, the north and the dust that would blow over the school. Um, this was an animated uh, camera system system that would be placed on the roof of the school. I was in charge of everything that started with F, uh, first year teachers, flags, photocopiers and first aid. And um, this was the uh, looking south where there were more trees. Um, we were interested in being able to um, collect weather. Um, we were making connections. Um, I've been involved with a project by Al Gore called the um, Globe Project of connecting students around the world with this rudimentary internet that uh, Al Gore had invented. And I was keen to use um, NetMeeting. This is a Japanese sister school. They were excited they could talk to Australia. Um, we'd wave at each other across the internet and it was really quite exciting for us. I guess I was looking for a way to be able to collaborate and do this stuff. For the GLOBE mission, we were collecting research data, um, crunching the data through, um, doing some rudimentary analysis with it. And for the students, it was a chance to go outside and sit inside the chicken wire cage. We had to do this because um, students would come in and vandalize it, and at least this way we could protect the uh, weather instruments. Um, on top of the school, um, I placed a weather station. This is our caretaker, Alex. Um, his great great grand ancestors had built the Acropolis, and he thought it was a notable tribute that uh, he could also build my weather station here. Um, there's Alex. Um, we collected the data. Um, I wanted to put a camera up there and actually start to collect things. This was our camera. We only had one camera in the whole school, and we made a lot of use of it. Um, I got invited by mistake to a um, conference at the Science Works, which is a um, lovely little place on the other side of the bridge in Melbourne. Um, I didn't know what, so we had to quickly think of an experiment because we didn't actually have anything to present. So I grabbed the photocopy and made paper scientific instruments. That's as much as our school budget could afford, as you can imagine. Um, we went there, we had a wonderful presentation. This is the science minister who came in and had a look at our uh, presentation of uh, paper balances and scales. Mind you, we were nestled amongst all these private schools who had their plastic dissections and uh, computer equipment. And anyway, Barry Jones was impressed, so I was very happy about that. Um, our school um, is a unique juncture in the universe. Um, it's aligned perfectly along the axis of east and west, which means at one time of the year, the solstice, the sun stretches down the corridor. I used to terrify the cleaning staff by laying on the ground and taking photographs at that particular event there. <laughs> and they'd stare with horror at the sunlight as it ended. It was like that the science cupboard at the very end, some demonic beast would come strolling out. Um, as it was um, in 1769, um, there's another chap um, who went sailing off in his um, fleet to the other side of the world and tried to do the same thing with the transect of Mercury. You see, we repeated this in 2003. Um, the, the chap's name's um, Captain Cook. I'll do a bit of name dropping here. And um, we had um, a class. Um, I set the camera up. There's our same camera. We had good, as you've seen, 10 years. We're still using this one camera. Um, and we put this up and we broadcast it on the school's web server. I was excited. We had a transect of Mercury. I had an extra class. We made a pinhole camera out of the room and we followed it around. 
me pushing it on the floor, the kids were wrapped, they could get out of doing the maths extra, which is boring anyway, and we were doing this wonderful stuff, and you can see the Aoife lead crawling across the room there with the laptop, and here we are with the students, we pointed out, that's Mercury, and they were just stunned about it. And there we are, another scene. This was just revolutionary stuff here. And there are the students here, and they began to share some of their stories, because some of their ancestors had eaten Captain Cook when they were in the islands. <laughs> and we were just in awe at the idea of technology bringing the world together and linking us with history. So I wind forward to 2004, because we started to make out of this space junk. That's what we could afford. Um, this was our technology program. No tinker trace for us. We were raiding the rubbish bins for all sorts of spare supplies to make satellites here, pushing the boundaries of technology forward in ways we hadn't seen before, using um, animation programs to at least give the simulation of a space background here. This was the Hubble Space Telescope. And then starting to use some of the open source software. And that was where we began to realize we didn't have to have a lot of this high tech stuff. There's a lot of exciting things happening that didn't require this technology. I had a phone call. Principal said, there's a bloke who wants to talk to you. He's from NASA. You can't bullshit NASA. And it sounded really terrifying, like it's worse than you've missed your science extra. You know? <coughs> OK, um, as it was, um, this guy Bill called me and he said, I need you to make something for me. I had no idea it was Bill Knight, a science guy. Um, and I said, yes. And he said, we'll send it. You got a fax? They had faxes then still. Only North Korea's got faxes now. Um, and we're cranking out this huge fax, and we started to make this thing. Um, it was terrifying. Um, students were working furiously. This was the uh, year 10 boys. Um, we'd kind of finished the school program. They, you kind of have them on park until about the end of November, then they go feral. Um, and they were busy trying to work for these calculations. And there were a lot of calculations. We had to get spreadsheets out, do the calculations to construct this earth dial. So here we are in the back of the computer room. Look at the big boxes there. The girls were busy painting. You can see the Linux penguin up the top there. We're a very open source school. <laughs> there we go, Earth dial. And what had actually happened, two worlds, one sun, we hadn't realized it. There's the Bunnings crew, they donated the wood. They get their photo. No idea what they were standing up for, but. <laughs> um, and there's me on the roof, We've got Alex up there. I've got to mount this thing, Alex, this is really important. It's from NASA, you can't bullshit NASA. Um, we found an old CD I'd left there 10 years earlier. <laughs> and here we are, it's my father, and we're screwing this thing together in the shed. Um, we're nicking bits off the Christmas tree, actually, because um, that's one of the dongles there to get this thing up and running. And we did it. In two weeks, we managed to construct ourselves an earth dial. And there's my little daughter, Erica. She'll appear a bit later. I'll just show you the time span here. So 2006, we had this thing running on the roof of the school. And we hadn't realized that Bill had made a mistake. He'd forwarded contact at a college. Sorry, Monash. Um, <laughs> but um, he'd actually contacted a high school. He'd seen the webcast of our Mercury transit or the can-do school. But he'd forgotten that the ABC took pity because we were Westall at the bottom of the list. They actually flipped the list around and stuck us on the top of the list. And so. Um, we have one in the Smithsonian Museum, one at the British Science Museum, one in Brazil, um, one in San Diego, Utah. And there's another one actually um, in Westall Secondary College was made um, by a bunch of year 10 students. And they thought it was absolutely hilarious. Um, we'd actually pulled it off. Um, so here we are, we've got our earth dial. Um, here it is actually broadcasting here. Um, and um, we had a calibration problem until we realized that, oh yes, daylight saving. Um, but it was a lot of fun. And for the high school students, oh, by the O, oh, by the way, was filled in. It was a knot in the wood we couldn't get rid of um, in Melbourne there. Um, it was exciting. NASA actually had mucked up a little bit because we were the only Southern Hemisphere reference station for this project. Um, they hadn't taken into account, because that was the, one of the charts on the facts that came uh, through, and then we got a, another image later. The reflection of the sun off the panel and the Perspex cover actually interfered with the web camera. And it took us two days to figure out how to get some polarizing filters to actually take out the problem. And it was a real crack up. So they were very impressed with the Australian ingenuity of being able to solve problems. Well, the Planetary Society featured our work. Um, we had a chance to uh, give some um, internet um, hangouts and presentations about what we're up to and what we're doing. So there we were. We were on Mars. We were on the back of the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. 
because on the backs of these rovers was a sundial and we were the reference station. So if you went to the NASA website and have a look at Spirit, an opportunity, when you were looking, there was Westall, a little high school in Melbourne, made by a bunch of kids who were waiting to uh, finish off the Year 10 program. Low sun, high sun. And the kids would come back two weeks later and you'd have the day and night swap over. And it really was another planet. Well, that was a wonderful six-month project, but the rovers didn't stop. Um, Deborah Vane, mission director from the uh, CLADSAT environment mission, came down and visited the school. She couldn't believe what had actually happened. And she came into a classroom filled with cardboard satellites and um, all sorts of crazy equipment. And I was really excited because we had a chance to show off what we were doing, and we were the real McCoy. Um, NASA couldn't believe it and invited me to JPL to give a talk about um, the work that the kids have been doing. Um, and I love that stick on the back of the bike, real men love science. Um, these were a really crazy, wonderful bunch of guys. Um, we had a chance to talk about the real satellite models that they make. Um, had a chance to uh, look at the, um, some of the modeling, how they build them. One thing I didn't realize is they actually hand make satellites. It's not like they just pull the bits off the shelf. They actually cut these out with Stanley knives and bits and pieces and screw them together. That's one of the clean rooms where they were um, assembling, I think that was the OCO satellite. This is one of the uh, test banks where they do the testing for the uh, rover robots. I did what we could do best at our school. Um, we decided to make a dance about it. Monash University. Galileo. And like all good things. <laughs> Try and get rid of this. There we go. It's better. So, I think having won the Science Drama Award with a production about the life and death of the universe, I could sort of rest on my laurels. But the kids wouldn't stop there. Um, we were invited to give a tour. I'll just put Galileo aside for a moment. So we had a chance to uh, give a tour here of the Tidbin Builder Tracking Station. That's the uh, Chief Na NASA Publicity Director there. Um, again, we kept the system going. Um, we had the equipment on the roof of the school here. The rovers wouldn't stop running. Um, in 2011, I was invited to the uh, Curiosity rover launch. Um, before I ran up there, I had to actually quickly scrub the side of the panel. Um, this is the actual weather station. This is me. Um, accumulated 10 years because we'd only expected the rovers to run for six months. In 10 years, they're still running around on Mars. And this is me furiously getting up there, scraping the bird poo off, uh, scraping the rubbish off. Um, scrubbing away furiously, as every teacher should do to keep their scientific instruments in peak condition here. <laughs> I mean, it's just... Okay, that's enough about my impoverished science program. Um, so, um, where's the coding connection? Well, Bill and I asked me to ramp this up. Can you see? That's Bill. And we don't bullshit NASA. So, 2012, um, we had another Venus transit, but I was getting a bit tired of all of these uh, astronomical events. They got their teachers excited and bringing out the 3D glasses. Um, we had a chance to uh, take some of my scout groups up to Canberra, um, fire lasers at stars. There's my daughter, Erica, 10 years later. Just hold your breath there. I was inspired by this little beast here. It's a rip of what they've done with the rovers. And I was excited about what we can do. So I met up with um, Russell Jenkins, who helped me coordinate the uh, CLADSAT dance, and said, I want to try something a bit different. Um, my moonshot was to actually model a vehicle, program it to move, and code it to think. I got a bit tired of those science competitions where the kids would make the solar car, and they'd put pipe cleaners and curly things on it, and it would look really cool, and it'd run along a track, and you think, wow, you can convert sunlight into electricity. I wanted it to think, and I thought, this was my moonshot. Because collision avoidance is something that 
is a real problem. This is in Brisbane at one of the conferences I went to, by obviously one of the buses that had trouble recognising where the road starts and finishes. Um, it's the real world, and I thought there's a real problem here. I took the same group of students here to a workshop at Vic Roads where we had a look at the traffic operations room. We were interested to see here how um, we can actually model the movement of traffic around a city. Now the students were already programming. Um, in this case it was my year 10 game programming class. Um, I subverted it and told them that this is a game. and. Um, <laughs> And they, they, could, they could see the connection. It was really cool. Um, we were modeling the traffic. Um, we were having a look at um, how vehicles move, um, how they collide. I didn't realize, you see those guys on the clipboards on the sides of roads? They're not counting cars. That's what the loops do. What they're actually doing is actually looking at the psychology and the behavior of the drivers. Because when you actually build a model like this, people who drive in Noble Park, where I was teaching, are very different from the people who are driving around the city. In fact, we saw one of the cars doing wheelies around the roundabout, and they picked out my students. Ah, they're from Noble Park where we were from. So um, we began to see the whole system as being something very different. We impressed Vic Rhodes because after this wonderful presentation, and we showed some of the programs the kids had made using the Scratch interface for programming. This is the brainstorm that the kids had after the session. I quickly did on the board as a bit of an assessment technique. Teachers like that kind of thing. You, know, you can take a photo and impress the principal that you actually did some thinking there. And what we ended up doing here was realizing that this was really complicated. Because up to now, you know, we were kind of building things. Just hold that thought, because I'm going to revisit that in a moment. We did a publicity photo here for the principal. Here we are. We've left ourselves curious and hungry. Here's the model that the kids were making. That's a train, and you had to quickly jump between the train tracks. Now you don't have to worry about it. It's sky rail. You can just fly underneath. Um, this is the intersection um, with some different vehicles here, um, some of the collision zone problems. It's really quite complicated. We wanted to actually make something from this. So we got ourselves some of the wires and plugs and kits. Um, IT had been disassembled. The only computers left in the school that we could really use were in the art department. Um, they managed to hang on them for the music keyboards. And that was kind of handy because um, we could click these bits together and hide under the benches there um, and then actually do some of the circuitry and componentry. We got away with it. Um, we found a cupboard that music weren't using. We could hide our stuff. This is my auto car team. Um, we actually got together. We met in the library, a maker space, and we built our car. This one's 20 bucks worth of a cardboard car. Um, we managed to get Vic Road to provide us with a hummingbird kit. Um, it's an Arduino-based control system, and we began to start to program it. We had some software called Snap that we could integrate with that. That allowed us to actually do some of the hacking that was necessary to make it work. We wanted to make a car that could move and think. Really exciting stuff. This is the Finch robot. Um, it's kind of cute. Um, has a little blinky nose at the front um, and measures light, temperatures, obstacles. I, I know we can do this with the Lego robotics. What was nice was you could kind of crack it open and see, oh, it's, it's got circuits inside. Because these are the kind of generation of kids that if you ask them what's inside a phone, it's full of magic. Because we don't actually open phones. You know, we put them into the recycle bin and that's it. Um, you guys might remember pulling apart radios and TVs and stuff. This is a generation that's actually quite protected from that. You know, it's protected by user agreements and um, magic. And I'd like to think that I can maybe steer a generation to take some of that mystery away and give them a sense of control and change and empowerment. There's some of the code the students did here. Um, and that was quite fun. This is using a, a Scratch interface. Um, Scratch is a nice introductory step. I use it between the junior school and the senior school will be step up to using Python programming. And that's usually um, with the NCCC uh, programming challenge and some of the wonderful things happening at a Sydney University. What was really nice was that um, students started to pick up things because we had a bit of a freelance run on it. Um, one of them encountered these problems. He said, the thing stops working. And it, this, this revelation, I figured it out. It's your stupid forever loop, sir. He <laughs> said, how'd you figure it out? He said, I took them out and, I, and it started to work. <laughs> and then I realized, yeah, OK, um, there's an iteration problem, a bit of a memory leak, and then just eventually <laughs> just sucks itself up. But it was nice. He discovered it himself. This was something that I had to learn, I think it was uh, second year uni, in the way I was writing my code. And he'd actually figured out himself at year 10. 
I don't really think it was 10,000 lines of code. <laughs> Some of the students have popped in the slideshow here. This is the Hummingbird Kit. Um, the way we'd kind of assembled it, we had the Arduino interface. Um, we were keen on collision avoidance. Um, we had the sensors. They were made of bits of wire. Um, we were inspired to actually build our program, our first vehicle. And here's the actual vehicle. This was uh, last year, the inspiration that we had. Um, we saw the idea that we could just make all the wires on the outside and make something look like that. I admitted the kids that the DeLorean was my favorite car. So we started to make our own DeLorean. Um, here we are with our $20 cardboard car, screwing on all the components. Oh, this is Dale. Dale wasn't interested in programming, but he loved engineering. And we let him loose on a hot glue gun. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh boy, I had to learn the hard way. Um, he glued everything in place. That car was going nowhere. That wonderful kit was never going to be reused again, but it was solid. He said, sir, here you are. There's your DeLorean. Be happy. Um, oh, gee. Um, well, we made it into the Age newspaper. Um, the girls were really engaged with it. Tina was fantastic. I suddenly realized that I'd been missing out on the best half of the school was the empowerment the girls had in actually leading the team together, getting those boys to climb out of their shells in the bedrooms and actually um, be able to talk with each other and collaborate online. We had Google Hangouts. We'd sort of talk, collaborate, plan, build. Um, we actually came um, and we brought the extra people in, Vic Rhodes, a Code for the Future programmer, Space Tank Studio Makerspace, the robotics expertise. I brought in everybody I had. And I think that one of the secrets I have is that you can't do this kind of STEM stuff alone. There are wonderful partnerships that you can make with different groups. And I think that's really powerful where Monash is making the connection with um, the various industries and enterprises. Um, STEM is, from my background, not so much about defining a subject in terms of science, technology, engineering, maths, but it's about the STEM principles of learning and being able to apply that in each of the different areas. It's not a series of acronyms or a bracket around a subject like humanities. It's a process and a way of thinking and a principle of learning. We built a team together. We had a lot of fun. We learned a lot of different things along the way, but it ramps up. And now I'll bring you to here. You see, we wanted to take it one step further and to share and challenge this with other schools. We realized, if you remember that original mind map, that it was actually much more complicated. The idea of a smart city was where we were heading towards. Because you may build an autonomous vehicle, but what makes it smart is when it talks to other vehicles. We could do that with the Lego robotics. But when it starts to talk with other infrastructure, and we could do that, because with the humming, with the um, MBOT kits that we'd suddenly stumbled across, they allowed us to actually use the infrared controller to talk to infrastructure. I'll bring you to where we are now. I'm just going to jump to a video. did what we were mucking around in Dale of his hot glue gun. Um, these were $110 and they were assembled by the students. The circuitry is naked exposed and you can directly control the Arduino processor on them. I'm excited by some of the ideas of being able to use Python at this conference. So make sure you have a look out for some of the sessions there. We don't have to rely on just a scratch interface. Um, I think this is a really big step forward for my group and then being able to kind of program and code these things to do the job that they need to do. But what are we going to do with them? Yet a 
listen to another discovery. Command sequence, um, and this is by putting a loop and then an event way. And I'm a fit, I love um, using a clap as a means to start the sequence. Let's program it. Yeah. So to program, you press the. Button. This is the new school I'm at. They don't have any programming classes. They don't have a year 11, 12 IT class. And with some of the encouragement done with getting the kids excited about coding and programming. And I think what's important for girls, seeing how they can make the world a better place by solving problems. This to me was really powerful. Letting them play with it, thinking about it, looking for the kind of ways we can engage them. Um, they even made a smiley face, allowing them to actually screw the robots together. It's a chance to have some hands on play with this technology understand how it works and that's how our robot school lives. But it was more than just simply a few running things on a flat surface. It was a three dimensional component. That's where these drones came in. And a chance to sort of think about our city in terms of a three D space of interactions between devices and infrastructure and vehicles and pedestrians. And we tried our own challenges too. <laughs> some things worked and some things were a little crazy. This was our smart city chance to sort of showcase that ITS 2016. So we actually were invited to a conference here in October with that same class and with Dale and the other crew. Um, this is what we're going to be showcasing in the foyer outside. Um, it's an ITS conference. Um, we want to show the makerspace, and these are the smart city models that we're making with actual buildings, with LED lighting and with little traffic light control systems. Um, we have a makerspace, we want to show people how we do the squishy electronics, how we do the wearable technology, how we do the coding as kids. Um, because it's a very different playful approach in the way that we've approached it in terms of STEM learning and engagement. Our little vision of what we could do to make that kind of system that we dreamed of at Dick Roads and build the kind of future that we saw ourselves as being a part of. It was a game, but it's the real game. We had some wins, we had some failures. Best of all, we made progress and we learned a lot on the way. We had schools in Ballarat, Brisbane, Adelaide, WA, Melbourne, all contributing their ideas. And these may be small victories. Brisbane, Melbourne. We also had the help of Tony from Code the Future. He was fantastic. Gave us a sense of real programming, kept raising the bar and provided us with some real-world links about how programmers actually work and think and solve problems. Tony was the brains trust for our group and gave a sense of real-time problem solving to the kids as they posed questions on the Facebook page. Many of the ideas might be buried inside the code and inside a few boxes, but for us the journey was real about learning the code, learning the program, learning to think about the kind of world we might live in, our smart city. See you at ITS. Now, I know that the, let's go back here. Oops. So that's our challenge, it was to build a smart city involved schools and it's been exciting for us to be able to bring on board all the different um, stakeholders and to scale it up. Um, I'm still a teacher, uh, I have goofy fun with the kids, but where I'm heading is the future. Because if I'm serious about engaging kids in the kind of future that I'm going to be living in, then I want them to think about taking a stake and being able to code it, build it, ask questions about it. Be nice to your students and your children because they'll design and build the nursing homes that we'll all reside and live in. <laughs> Um, I, it's a very different journey. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I'll um, open up if there's any questions you'd like to ask me about the project. Uh, it's a very passionate one. Um, in case you're curious, you flip the maps over, they become a Mars terrain. And so once we finish the smart city, they'll become a, a rescue mission for Mars. Cool. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roland. 
Are there any questions? There's a lot in there. I imagine there's a lot of questions. All right, we'll start at the back. Um, what age groups do you find um, most successful in engaging with this? Um, and have you got experience with the kind of grade six to nine range? Yes, um, we have some of the primary schools. Um, they're more focused with using the Sphero robots and um, just doing the basic line tracking and city construction. For the older students, the year nine and 10, I think I'm more happy with them to actually start actually doing some hardcore programming. Program the Arduino face directly. Um, consider how to use the infrared controller to communicate to infrastructure. And one of the challenges that we have is actually doing that vehicle to vehicle infrastructure. We've got the same problem that ITS has. How do we agree on an open standard for sharing information? And once that is picked up by the students, they begin to see it in other ways that we do coding and programming. And I think that's a really powerful learning lesson if I can share that with the students. Um, because we don't necessarily, it's not an easy problem to do. We can't do it with the Lego robotics, but we can do it with the MBOTs. We face up to it. We're only simulating and modeling that problem solving process, but I'm hoping that they can take those lessons on. And that's different for the older students at year 10 than from perhaps the younger students, which is just solving problems of how to navigate around a city. Another question? So you're obviously very passionate and very knowledgeable, um, but uh, a lot of schools don't have <coughs> people like you, and in particular don't have supporting principals um, as well. Uh, in your journey, uh, you've obviously changed schools as well. Mm. You, you could just comment a bit about um, the the resources needed, uh, teacher education, principal education, and, and sort of the future of of the school system in this in this regard. I think it's really important to find partnerships. Um, you have institutions like we had with the Games Laboratory at RMIT. Um, with some of my past students have gone on to uh, Monash University. Um, maintaining a connection with them. Um, also industry uh, providers like uh, Vic Roads, uh, Transurban. Um, some of the parents uh, in, a, in the local area are trying to reinvent themselves. Um, some are moving into tra intelligent traffic systems, bringing them on board. Um, the idea that any one teacher holds the key to knowledge is never really going to happen. But neither does a principal in deciding perhaps where the real world is. Um, we call it a game, but it's the real game, and it's life. Um, I don't pretend to have all the answers or that um, all our cars are going to be Arduino powered. <laughs> They're not. Um, in fact, one of the things I picked up really quickly was that um, when I went to one of the transurban guys, he said, you guys have got it tough. Um, we sit inside the vehicle with our laptops and do the testing and we've got dozens of computers. You've only got one and you have to try and steer it from the outside. But the social issues are the same and principals understand that. The imperative to move away from a manufacturing base to perhaps moving towards one that's based on smart technologies, the principles do understand that. And the idea that perhaps the STEM principles of learning are really powerful and they apply to a lot of different subject domains, that's not a hard sell. But what we need to do is actually give educators the opportunity to find the points of leverage to bring those outside experts in and to help drive the change. Um, I think that passion is probably more important than having all of the knowledge and technical expertise Yep. Okay. Question. I'll just also note that like that's one of the reasons for the community partnership with Code Club because that's one of the big problems they're interested in helping to solve. Any more questions? Oh, we'll come back to you. I was um, really interested in the dynamic change you said with having the girls involved in the group. Just wondering how you met the challenge of actually getting the girls to engage with technology. Let them lead. I think sometimes we come with our own preconceptions about how boys, because I've taught a lot of boys for a long time. Um, having girls in the classroom, though, does change the dynamic. Um, sometimes they're quieter and more reserved, and um, I have to find a point of leverage. I have to shut the boys up. I've got tools and ways of doing it. Um, I allow the girls to work together, form a geek chick club, um, find some good female role models from outside, and just to tell the boys to shut up, because they will tend to dominate it. Um, I think, and it's something I've learned now working at a girls' school, find the social mission, um, why this will make the world a better place to live in. You can't, I think, have those conversations, oh, this would be a great career, oh, you get lots of money, guaranteed employment, and it's not going to work like that. It's more a case of this will make the world a better 
place, you're going to be able to use this to actually drive change. Maybe make the website for Greenpeace, maybe actually design the medical system that will replace the bionic ear or maybe the, the bionic eye. Imagine a change that you can have. Or there's a group called Enable that does some wonderful stuff where kids are 3D printing their own prosthetic devices. And that's something that I'm talking to the principal about. It's kicking off next year with our uh, program at uh, the school I'm at now. That's powerful. And that, I know, finds traction with the girls. Um, and I think also, as I said, they've got some great social skills and being able to see the team rather than just the selfish ego, that sometimes some of the boys do, and I'm being able to tap into that knowledge. Um, I'm not an expert at it, but I think if I'm open to different ways of teaching and being sensitive to the needs, then that's probably the best way to move it forward. Um, but you're right, there's some interesting gender issues I've got to sort of work through and dynamics there. Thank you. So are you doing this as part of your science class or is this extra time you've got for doing the project, the Smart City project? I sneak it in all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I managed to convince all the faculty. I've convinced the maths teacher it's a maths project. I've convinced uh, okay. the technology teacher it's a technology. And, and that's just the nature of, look, when I was a science, when I was working in research science, no one actually says, you are a biochemist, you know. What the hell are you doing in explosives? Um, yeah. It was a case of actually me being sensitive to the, when I was out of my competency, and to talk to people about, I need to solve a problem. I have a modelling problem with a borehole. I need to get some simulations um, prepared for doing that. Um, and then being able to negotiate with the math stakeholders or the IT stakeholders. Um, and I think that with the way I'm doing it, it's a bit of an extracurricular thing. Um, mm. The bulk of it is actually probably done with the Year 10 Games programming class and with the Year 9, the Rise of the Robots class. Okay. Um, but the, um, that's not to say that I don't have science students involved or yeah. I don't have the maths, um, the maths kids involved. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we'll probably wrap up questions there. Thank you, Roland. Thank you. Um.